Okay, so good afternoon, everyone, on this fine final afternoon of Lyra. Um, uh, in this session, uh, we are going to hear four fascinating papers. Uh, um, three of the speakers are actually here right now. Hopefully, uh, the other will will show up. Um, so the so the speaker who is not here yet is Eric Blank. Um, and he'll be speaking about uh, social media um, and how it's used by organizers of teachers strikes in Oklahoma and Arizona. We have a paper by Andrew Keyes, Zachary Russell, and Jack Fiorito on um, kind of pro-social instrumentality of union members and how it's associated with satisfaction with their unions. We have a paper with Rachel Alex and Johnny Callis on um, kind of the sequence of events that lead to success or failure in organizing campaigns. And we have a paper by Steve Sylvia on the history of industrial industry policy in the United States. Um, we haven't decided which order we're going to go in. Um, I, thinking about the logic of it though, um, Steve, would you mind going first? That's fine. Okay. So eight minutes, huh? I'll do yeah. my best. Okay. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, I should say the reason why uh, I wrote this paper originally is because um, the Metal Workers Union in Germany asked me to. And uh, they are putting together a book which will be out in a couple weeks on recovering from COVID. And uh, they are looking at all sorts of ideas and they, they had uh, international comparisons and, and industrial policy figured prominently in it. And they wanted something on the US and something on China. I wrote this on the US. Um, I, I got eight minutes, so I'm gonna be brief. There's a lot more in the paper uh, as far as detail. Let's see. Okay, so just very quickly, um, industrial policy, most of you know what it is, but I think the key things to hit is that it is governments including goal-oriented thinking and policy making to improve economic performance. And implicit in that assumption is that there is market failure that needs to be addressed and that governments can identify it and correct it. One thing that industrial policy is not is just, you know, simple protectionism to protect uh, non-competitive sectors. And the tactics are microeconomic tactics that they're helping sectors and firms. This isn't fiscal or monetary policy. So the repertoire of industrial policy hasn't changed that much since Hamilton. You can pick which Hamilton you want. Uh, and uh, the basic uh, pieces are uh, helping infant industries. So that's supporting emerging sectors with financing, subsidies, or tariffs. Infrastructure expansion is a second piece. Government procurement is a third piece. The fourth piece, sponsored research and development. That's the only piece that uh, Alexander Hamilton didn't mention back in 1791 when he wrote the essay concerning manufacturers. So there are a number of episodes of industrial policy in the US. I'm only gonna focus on two of them here as a, by way of contrast. Um, I'm gonna focus on the period in the 1970s and 80s in our current period and the striking thing when you look at the 1970s and 80s is it was a union-led effort and it was by and large a partisan project to try to implement industrial policy and it failed. Um, the reason why it came to the fore was the United States was experiencing stagflation, high inflation, high unemployment, low growth, deindustrialization set in. Japanese competition uh, was having a big impact on many sectors. And the political reason for pursuing this is that on the right, the ideas of supply side economics and neoliberalism were first being launched and the unions wanted 
a political alternative and they seized on industrial policy. So when you do the research on it, you can see prominent pictures and discussions with Lane Kirkland, the president of the AFL-CIO at the time, leading the industrial policy study group with prominent officials, you know, a lot of union uh, leaders, but also a few CEOs like the head of Chrysler then, Lee Iacocca, the head of DuPont. There were also some more or less gadfly uh, uh, academics like uh, Robert Reich, uh, Lester Thoreau, they were involved in this as well. The opponents were uh, Reagan Republicans, Wall Street was very much against it, and mainstream economists were very much against it. And the big uh, knock that uh, people like Charles Schultz, uh, the guy at Brookings, not the guy who drew peanuts, uh, made uh, about um, industrial policy was that can't, do we think the government can really pick winners? The result was nothing. Uh, there were really no ins elements of industrial policy that were implemented. Uh, Reagan's economic policies, deregulation and large fiscal deficits did reignite growth. It, it ignited a lot of other things like inequality and many other ish problems. So that was this period where there was this union-led effort to get industrial policy and it failed. Now, it was striking when the metal workers asked me to do this, um, I was a bit perplexed. And as I began to dig into it, I found out uh, why. And that is when you look at today, there is definitely a second push of industrial policy. And it the, today is a group of strange bedfellows pushing it. That So to, to hit on the two points like I just did on why did it come to the fore now, sluggish growth again, including job loss. Um, this time it's Chinese competition and inequality is an issue. And then politically, I think is quite salient. And that is that populism and Donald Trump shattered the, Repu the Reagan Republican consensus around free trade. Reagan had some exceptions, but we're not going to, you know, I'll leave those aside and limited government. And when you look at who has brought it forward, industrial policy, it has been mainstream Democrats, including Chuck Schumer and Republicans trying to appeal to workers. So we saw Orrin Cass earlier in the plenary today. One of the things that his think tank, American Compass, has been pushing has been industrial policy. Um, Tom Cotton, Rubio, the usual handful of suspects among the Republicans who are trying to figure out a way to attract blue collar workers to the Republican, policy, uh, Republican Party. Uh, the other thing that's striking is unions have not really been prominent in pushing for industrial policy. They've been willing to go along and say nice things, but unions haven't really been involved at all. Uh, the opponents, some familiar, the, the what's left of the Reagan Republicans in the Republican Party, um, Wall Street, of course, is still against it. Most economists remain against it, although they aren't vocal either. So we, we don't have an ideological divide and even in these very divided, very partisan times, we actually have more happening. That um, we had, you know, Biden do the executive order of Buy American. We had the, you know, the American Recovery Plan. Uh, but even today, uh, right now, going through the Senate is the U.S. Innovation and Competitiveness Act, which is very likely to pass. And this is a, a, an act that will support uh, semiconductors, will support 5G, um, will crack down on cyber criminals. So it is very much an industrial policy. So it's interesting seeing in a much more divided time politically, there actually has been progress on industrial policy. And I'm probably over eight minutes. So I think I'll stop there. Thank All right. You. Well, fantastic. Thank you. Okay. So um, I was thinking this was relevant to our session because it was about something that unions want, but you're saying unions aren't deeply involved in it. Um, but I'm going to, so the next speaker is Eric 
Blanc or Blank, and he's going to talk about what uh, unions are doing, in particular uh, in education. So, Eric, uh, just I'm uh, my screen um, right now. Share my screen. Um, okay, I'm going to go to the beginning. So, uh, I'll, I'll jump into it. First of all, it's great to see all of you, and apologies for uh, some tough technical difficulties on my end. Um, I just want to make sure it's hey. Ah, there we go. There. Is it going? Can you, you can see it okay? Um, the topic for the paper I have real quick um, is what were the dynamics of digital organizing in the 2018 teacher strikes in West Virginia, Oklahoma, and Arizona. For, for this paper presentation right now, just focus in on Arizona and Oklahoma. Um, the basic argument, and this is laid out in a much longer article that's actually just got accepted at Politics and Society, which goes into all of the details, which you can check out and I can send to anybody if they're interested. The summary is a comparative analysis of Oklahoma and Arizona, the outcomes of the strikes, shows the ways that digital media, um, you know, and social media in particular, and in this case, Facebook in particular, um, can be used both to harness uh, organizing and also to undercut it. And I identified two mechanisms that um, make this possible, particularly the undercutting aspect. One is um, social media can enable inexperienced individuals to become mass leaders. This is what happened in Oklahoma. And they can also uh, facilitate, they do often facilitate mobilizing without organizing. Um, and so just briefly, this relates to the literature on ICTs uh, that says, um, you know, New, new media lowers costs. It, it requires that you don't need organize, organization anymore. Anybody can lead. Most of the literature says that's a positive thing. And I'm trying to ask, well, uh, is that always a positive thing? And, and how does that relate to labor struggles in particular? There's been some critics say, uh, actually digital media only does slacktivism. Uh, there's a digital divide. Workers you know, can't have access to the same tools um, and old organizations are still important. And more or less what the experience of the 2018 strikes shows is the limitations in both, both approaches, um, because it was both the case that, as we'll see, that digital media in some cases did facilitate um, weak organization, kind of mobilizing protests without the deep organizing infrastructure. But in the case of Arizona, it actually was a tool to deepen organizing rather than a uh, um, block on it. So briefly, the um, 2018 strikes, I'll skip this slide because we already saw it. The, um, the comparison is interesting because the organizations in Oklahoma and Arizona were actually more favorable to a favorable, were more conducive to a favorable outcome in Oklahoma. Unions, for instance, were stronger in Oklahoma than Arizona. Um, nevertheless, the strike in Arizona um, was by all metrics more successful. You had more workers went out on strike um, they won uh, just as much, arguably more, from the state as in Oklahoma and overwhelmingly felt like their struggle uh, had been more of a success. The graph here shows the growth in the Facebook pages. You actually see that in Arizona, they were more successful, despite the fact that their Facebook group was almost half the size. Um, and so then the puzzle is, why is it that Arizona strike shut down 92% of public schools uh, and Oklahoma strike shut down only 74% of public schools. Um, and to really summarize, I don't have to skip ahead. Uh, as I mentioned before, the first mechanism explaining this is leadership and experience. In Oklahoma, um, basically the guy who created the viral Facebook page had no union background, he had no activist experience. And so he didn't do the types of things that really basic organizers do, uh, really basic things that organizers do to build up um, support for a mass action. So to give you a sense of that, um, this is a um, chart just shows the different timelines. Arizona strike, they took over a month more. Uh, they did a strike authorization, whereas in um, Oklahoma, they really just sort of called for a strike and went out. The model to really show the, diff the second big difference is mobilizing versus organizing is uh, described here. So the top is Oklahoma. Morahone is the viral Facebook leader. 
basically just use ICTs to call for a strike. Whereas in Arizona, you had the creation of a leadership team of experienced organizers using digital media uh, who built up a thing called Arizona Educators United. They used ICTs to both build what they called site liaisons, which were more or less like shop stewards, but outside of union structures, they built this up from scratch using primarily digital tools. In turn, they also did build up actions, they did probably about 12 different statewide, what Jane McAlevey would call structure tests to scale up the uh, level of support, to test the level of support, to generate momentum, enthusiasm. These two things fed off of each other, more actions, but more organization, more organization, but stronger actions. And then only after uh, two months did they call for a strike. And the, uh, just a few more charts, you can see then the prioritization of the different approaches. AEU, this is for Arizona. You can see um, Arizona was far more focused on using digital media. This is the admin posts in, on the Facebook groups by topic. You can see that they're far more focused on promoting action uh, than in Oklahoma. Similarly, they were far more focused on promoting organizing than in Oklahoma. Uh, this was based on a qualitative coding of the data. So to move towards summarizing, um, the big takeaways I think from this experience are that ICTs do tend to transform movements, including those that are high risk and strong ties. But contrary to the implications of a lot of this literature, they can have negative impacts. This, and, and I think this is a big takeaway, this impact is mediated by strategy. Uh, too much of the literature on digital media assumes that there's kind of a one-to-one -one relationship between more media use and more types of certain types of movement dynamics. But in fact, what you see is um, the types of strategies that were used really had profound implications for both the outcome of the struggle and the impact of digital media on the mobilizing dynamics. Um, part of the reason why this dynamic has been overlooked in the literature is that the short-term potential liabilities of digital media uh, for things like strikes have just been uh, mo mostly overlooked because most of the focus of the literature has been on self-selecting mobilizations, things like mass protests or occupations, rather than the structure-based deep organizing that requires more proactive, outward-facing, uh, consistent talking with people who don't already agree with you. So the big takeaway, I think, from these strikes is um, Social media has been very effective, including in Oklahoma, at bringing on board people who already agree, but it still hasn't proven to be particularly effective on its own in winning over waverers um, and in broadening the base of support. And that requires uh, in-person organizing, which can be facilitated by digital media, but not uh, substituted by it. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you, Eric. Um, uh, Coming up next is Andrew Keyes, Zachary Russell, and Jack Purito. Um, so I think, Andrew, you're the one presenting. Ah, OK. OK, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Keyes. I'll be presenting some work that I'm doing with Dr. Zach Russell and Dr. Jack Fiorito on workplace instrumentality, pro-social instrumentality, and its relationship with union member satisfaction. Uh, so to start here, I want to talk a little bit about the breadth of representation activities that unions undertake and whether they're focused on the workplace or in broader political and social arenas. So on the left-hand side, we have business unionism and workplace instrumentality. Um, and here are unions really focus on wages, hours, and other terms and conditions of employment for union members, trying to increase uh, wages, shorten hours, and provide better working conditions. So this business unionism and workplace instrumentality is really focused on the workplace. And it kind of aligns with uh, US labor law if we think about um, the mandatory items of bargaining. And um, we know that workplace instrumentality and workplace issues are a top priority for union members followed by things like job content and quality of work life issues, while pro-social goals are relatively low, or excuse me, political goals are relatively low. Uh, this view is sometimes associated with member self-interest because members are trying to improve their own uh, working conditions while not doing things uh, for non-represented employees. In contrast to uh, the business unionism and workplace instrumentality uh, representation activities, social unionism and pro-social instrumentality um, occurs when unions press for progressive social and economic policies. Uh, but one of the big things here is that unions are doing this to advance the interests of all workers 
regardless of their union status. And so there's even some societal well-being here as unions try to help kind of all, all people. Um, Pro-social actions are kind of rooted in historical actions of unions, economic, political, and social justice are things unions have fought for, um, from the National Labor Union to the Knights of Labor to the modern day AFL-CIO. Um, you can see in the bottom two pictures on the right hand side of the screen some examples of pro-social activities unions undertake uh, the Chicago teachers in the one picture uh, and then unions pressing for higher minimum wages in the other. Um, so we know that unions um, undertake these two types of scope of representation activities. But we want to see kind of what drives satisfaction with the union uh, among union members. What do we know about that? Um, so research has found that unions performance is more highly rated when the union is successful in achieving um, satisfying, excuse me, satisfying members uh, instrumental needs such as wages and benefits. Um, another study found that instrumental issues and member union relations more strongly predicted satisfaction than quality of life issues. And a third study uh, also found that traditional instrumental issues and member union relations were important to member satisfaction. So in short, what drives satisfaction with the union? Um, one of the things we know that does is workplace instrumentality or those representation activities that help uh, members improve their own uh, workplaces. Is there anything else though that um, research has suggested drives satisfaction with the union? Um, well, a study by Koken found that while workers still viewed their unions as representatives of instrumental issues, Workers also are looking for an expansion of the domain of union activities into quality of work or some more unchartered areas. Uh, Fiorito observed that quality of life issues may have risen in importance since their survey on union uh, satisfaction was administered. And Jarley found that members consider union feedback, democracy, and the delivery of services as critical. Um, so if we look at what drives satisfaction with the union here, we see that there are some things that are not necessarily related just to workplace instrumentality. Um, but some other factors. And so we looked at that and we thought, well, um, perhaps some of these other activities that unions engage in, uh, in society and in the political realm might also drive satisfaction with the union. So our hypothesis was that perceived pro-social as well as workplace instrumentality will be associated with increased union member satisfaction. Uh, so to look at this, we have a two sample study. Um, in study one, it was a 2018 Qualtrics online survey. Uh, with 245 current or former union members. In study two, it was a 2003 telephone survey by Peter D. Hart Research Associates on behalf of the AFL-CIO, and there are 569 current or former union members. Um, these are some of the measures that we use for union experience, workplace instrumentality, and pro-social instrumentality. And because of time, I will, won't really go into these here. Um, so first of all, looking at some of the results, we want to first look to see how union members would describe their experience or their satisfaction with the union. And we see here that overall, um, it's pretty positive. Most members said good um, or even excellent. And overall, this aligns with prior polls on satisfaction with union representation. Uh, looking at some multiple regression results here, um, we see that union pro-social instrumentality as well as union workplace instrumentality both positively related to uh, union experience. Um, one other thing to point out here is that the effect size for pro-social instrumentality is slightly larger uh, than per union workplace instrumentality. Um, we also see here that women actually had higher satisfaction um, with their union than men. Um, and interestingly uh, here, we see a significance for the Southern region, which was the Southeastern part of the United States. Um, we also found in this survey that Republicans were more satisfied with their union than Democrats. Uh, looking at study two, which was a 2003 telephone survey, um, in this uh, sample, we also see that pro-social instrumentality as well as workplace instrumentality both positively contribute uh, to union experience. Uh, in this particular sample, um, pro-social instrumentality had a smaller effect size than workplace instrumentality. Um, in this sample, we see that Democrats were more satisfied with their union uh, than Republicans. Uh, so some discussion and conclusion here. Um, overall, we find that both workplace issues and pro-social issues are significant contributors to union member satisfaction. Uh, these results kind of lend credence to the view 
that unions should take part both in activities that represent members in the workplace, but also things in the social arena. Um, and so unions should extend kind of beyond their role as just a workplace representative. Um, in terms of limitation here, um, we'll note that while we most certainly believe there's a causal flow from beliefs to attitudes and affects, um, we acknowledge the, the data here is cross-sectional, so our results um, really demonstrate an association. And finally, kind of as a future research point, um, we thought it was interesting, the 2018 results showed that pro-social had a larger effect uh, than instrumental, while the converse was true in the 2003 data. Uh, so an area of future research could be, you know, is this a sample characteristic or changes over time? Um, we tend to think it might be changes over time, but that is an area for future research. So that's it, thank you. All right, um, hey, thanks, Andrew. Um, so uh, last but not least, uh, uh, Johnny Callis will be presenting his paper with Rachel Alex. Johnny, um, are you there? <laughs> <laughs> I think you hear me okay or really patchy. All right. So you see the, the share a screen button, right? Yeah, okay. You've shared your screen. Okay. Johnny, you have the okay. floor. I'm going to. Great. All right. Thanks so much, Ian. So thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I'm going to be presenting on uh, staying off on the right foot how organizing tactics affect first contract negotiations, and very much interested in hearing your feedback as we continue to work on this paper and work through the early stages of our data analysis. Rachel Alex is also here and may provide some thoughts during Q&A. So much of the research on union revitalization in the United States um, has focused on the outcomes of an election campaign. However, even if a majority of workers elect to form a union, they do not realize gains uh, made through organizing until achieving a first contract. Uh, the quote here in front of you shows that management consultants view signing a first contract as really the ultimate form of defeat in a union campaign. And in this paper, we really focus on the relationship between the NLRB organizing campaign, which is the regulated process to determine union certi certification in the US and first contract negotiations. Uh, rather than viewing a union election as the endpoint of a campaign or isolating the election campaign from the bargaining process, we really try and emphasize the interconnectedness of different campaign phases. So there's been much research, as you may know, on the nature and outcomes of NLRB election campaigns. And I'd like to emphasize here briefly just one central aspect, which is really the conflict inherent to these campaigns. So while conflict has always been embedded into the framework of secret ballot union elections, uh, employer opposition through both legal tactics like captive audience meetings and illegal tactics like the termination of union activists uh, really increased considerably in the late 20th and early 21st century. Um, and in response to this increased anti-union opposition by employers, many, many unions and labor organizations developed strategies like corporate campaigns that made organizing drives even more conflictual. And we really don't need to look any further than the recent unionization effort um, at an Amazon warehouse in Bessemer, Alabama, right? To understand that the almost warlike environment of these campaigns, um, workers face mandatory anti-union meetings, leaflets across the facility, including in bathroom stalls, at least when they were allowed to go to the bathroom, um, and up to as many as five text messages a day, encouraging workers to vote no, and this was before uh, voting even began. RWDSU also put out a retort titled, What's Wrong with Amazon? Documenting the company's inhumane labor practices. And really the bottom line here um, is if a union wins an election campaign marked by this level of conflict, both parties are then expected to sit across the table from one another to negotiate and come to an agreement uh, on a first contract. Just quickly moving on to data on first contract achievement, um, first contract rates or the rates at which unions secure a first contract after winning an election decreased, decreased considerably in the late 20th century. For example, Bronfenbrenner found in a survey of NLRB campaigns from 1999 to 2003 that only 48% of unions achieved a first contract within a year of certification. A quarter of all unions still had no contract more than three years after certification. And most of the relatively limited quantitative research on first contract determinants focus on the negative relationship between employer unfair labor practices and the achievement of a contract. Uh, Ferguson, for example, finds in a very comprehensive analysis that campaigns in which ULPs are filed after certification had a 78% less likely chance of reaching a first agreement. So this takes us to our research question. Um, so rather than treating the pre-election campaign and post-election bargaining as distinct and separate, 
In this paper, we ask how union and employer characteristics and tactics during an NLRB election campaign impact the likelihood of achieving a first contract. And we examine both union and employer characteristics and tactics, not just ULP filings. Um, just really quick, Bruno and Jordan explicitly asked this question in a 2005 article uh, through a phone survey and qualitative analysis of 32 organizing campaigns, half card check and half NLRB campaigns. And they conclude that the organizing campaign and first contract negotiations should really be viewed as a single process. Um, they argue that union tactics and capabilities, specifically a combination of increased membership activism and effectively identifying points of leverage against the employer are the most important factors in contract achievement. So to answer a research question, uh, we secured petition information from all 1,163 representation elections held through the NLRB in 2018. Uh, we then cold emailed before follow-up emails and phone calls our unique survey instrument to union representatives listed as the contacts on these petitions and received 242 surveys or a 21% response rate. And our preliminary data are based on 200 surveys as we wait on additional NLRB data. Um, in our preliminary sample of 200 campaigns, 141 or about 71% resulted in a union election victory. Of those, 69% were able to reach a first contract within about two years of certification. And we're still in the early stages of analyzing our data, but this is what we have so far. Um, so we've run two uh, probit models. The first dependent variable of interest is whether the union won the election. And the second is whether the union achieved a first contract, which is really what addresses our uh, research question. And our independent variables include the tactics and characteristics during the organizing campaign. So we examine their impact on both the election and first contract outcomes. I'm gonna really quickly read out the independent variables because I think they're obviously important. The first three relate to union tactics, union use of solidarity days, petitions, marches on the boss, uh, union use of public rallies, building community support and use of media, um, union tactics to negatively impact a company's public image, and then the last two are really about um, employer tactics and opposition, employer captive audience meetings and one-on-one -on -one, uh, meetings, and also employer unfair labor practices. Um, I should say ULPs in our case are self-reported by organizers. We plan to collect additional data from the NLRB to have an even more accurate picture of ULP filings and charges. And I'm not gonna read out our controls, but these are variables found in previous work to have statistically significant effect on our outcomes of interest. And then just the last couple of slides. So in terms of our preliminary results, we um, find that there does indeed appear to be a carryover effect between the election campaign and first contract outcomes. So in terms of union tactics, use of external pressure tactics, such as public rallies, building community support and use of the media during the election campaign um, positively affects the likelihood of reaching a first contract. In terms of employer tactics, we unsurprisingly found that the use of captive audience meetings during the election campaign negatively affects the likelihood of reaching a first contract. And I do want to emphasize that other bargaining unit characteristics outside of these union and employer tactics matter too, right? So, for example, having a majority female unit positively affected both election and first contract outcomes for the union. And last slide here, Ian, I apologize if I'm going slightly over. Um, in terms of our, uh, because we still have missing observations in our results, um, we plan to follow up with union representatives about item non-responses and the NLRB to fill gaps in our current data. We'll also plan to add variables in our model, um, such as certification and other process delays. And then finally, um, we'll rerun analyses using a similar model employed by Ferguson in his uh, 2008 paper, examining the sequential nature of campaigns. And with that, I'm done. Thank you very much and looking forward to feedback. All right. Well. Thanks everyone for fantastic and fascinating papers. Uh, I, I, I put the link to the papers in the, the, um, in the chat. Um, I'm going to try and do this, uh, say, say all this before 2.10 so we have plenty of time to discuss. Uh, and so I'm not going to waste lots of time saying how much I loved your papers and how excellent they are and blah, 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 and how you should, <laughs> and how much I'm enjoying Lyra, you know, that, that can all just go without saying because we don't have much time. Um, so Steve, uh, Mike, so uh, I loved hearing about the history of industrial policy from Alexander Hamilton to Joe Biden. Um, I, I had the, the musical uh, Hamilton playing in the background through much of uh, the pandemic because my kids are obsessed with it. 
And I, it led me to read a biography of him where it became where I, I got the impression that actually he didn't have an industrial policy. In that sense, he might have something in common with policymakers today. I mean, really, he was representing so, some kind of the interests of, of a group of, of people on Wall Street. Um, and, um, you know, he had, he had kind of a big business plan that, was, that uh, he wanted state support for. So, I mean, does the United States really have an, an industrial policy? And for that matter, does Germany really have an industrial policy? I've heard German trade unionists complain that there isn't one because they look to France where, where the government decides which industries should be targeted for development. And instead, what do we have here in the United States? We have a military industrial complex. We have a for-profit health industry. We have higher education institutions. We have the auto industry. And they're all demanding things from government and saying that you know, there will be problems if you don't support them. So yeah, my big question for you is, uh, is this really industrial policy that we're talking about in the US? And the second question is, how does the, how does the answer compare to that of Germany? Um, so, uh, the, oh, and a fourth one, since this is about unions, can you say why US unions aren't deeply involved? Because you did say that, but you didn't really unpack it. Um, so uh, the, the, next, I'd like to turn to Eric's paper, which I have um, I was really interested in the research methods. Um, uh, I, I am uh, fascinated with Facebook groups of unemployed people. Um, and uh, uh, so I, I think a lot in my own research ab about unemployed people, kind of what to do with all this rich data that they put on Facebook. And so um, your paper was really helpful for me in thinking about that. And I love the comparative approach where you're ruling out uh, alternate hypotheses. And I think I'm glad this is appearing in, in politics and society. I look forward to reading the final version. I mean, one thing, uh, one thing that struck me as different, a difference between this and the, the unemployed people's groups that I've looked at is that um, this seems to be much more tightly controlled and focused around a particular goal. Like with, with the unemployed uh, um, persons groups, there's a lot of like kind of chaotic stuff that, um, that is not focused on some kind of goal and okay yeah there are admins who can censor people but but that but but there's a lot of stuff that you know that is not coming directly from the admins and they seem to be learning things from it and there's just a lot of i mean it's a lot it's it's like a lot of other mobilization in this world that's not it's not being organized it's kind of uh it, it has this kind of spontaneous character um, and that's part of why it's so powerful because it's it's people's voices and they're demanding recognition and talking about their problems. And so I'm just wondering um, if there's an element of this that of where where the organizers are not in control that is important in explaining differences in outcomes. So uh, now I want to turn to Andrew and Zachary and Jack's paper. So we have something called union. We have something called pro-social instrumentality, something called workplace instrumentality, and something called union experience or union satisfaction. So these two kinds of instrumentality are associated with higher union satisfaction. And I just wanted to ask you, um, uh, so why, why do we care about union satisfaction? Why, why don't we talk about union engagement or commitment or or kind of involvement or mobilization or getting organized. Uh, it just seems like, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a dissatisfied union member and that's probably a good thing because it means I have high expectations and this is, this is partly caused by me being involved in the union. And so, I mean, shouldn't, shouldn't members of most unions be dissatisfied if they're truly engaged? Um, and shouldn't we be looking at other kinds of outcomes? Um, and, I'm, and I have a second question for you, which is just, uh, you know, is there your approach to doing this? And I've read a lot of papers by you and others like this. Is this at all relevant to uh, cases like, like Eric's where you have people who aren't even union members who are uh, organizing and, and leading activism and strikes? Um, 
So finally, I want to turn to Rachel and Johnny. Um, so uh, I just wanted to ask you all um, what you make of this distinction between organizing and mobilizing, because that seems to provide a much. Um, I mean, I don't know. How, I don't know if it if it gives you like if it's if it gives a good provides a good explanation for your outcome. But I'm just wondering. So I'm wondering if you have a criticism or if you agree with the idea that really you're going to lose if you don't build real structures that involve members rather than focusing on you know other things that you might call mobilization that are not that don't kind of reconfigure these relations and um you know basically the the McAlevey stuff that eric is very much very much agrees with and draws on i'm just wondering if you how you all uh, uh what you all think about that um, so th that's all for me. Um, why don't we do an, a round of responses to each other's papers and to my questions and um, hopefully respond, especially respond to my questions that refer to other papers. Um, so uh, Steve, why don't you go first? Sure, thanks. Thanks for your questions. They're, they're very helpful. Um, you know, the question, what is industrial policy? I think, you know, it, that it doesn't have to be French indicative planning or the 1980s Japanese Ministry of uh, Industry and Trade, that um, I think you can have pieces of industrial policy. But the thing that I'm focusing more on is, is more industrial policy is a political argument more than anything else. So I'm looking at episodes when industrial policy was used as a political argument to try to achieve ends. And so the connection between the two is important. Um, but, you know, when you're looking, when you're just talking about what am I looking at, I'm looking at people use deploying industrial policy as rhetoric. Um, and the thing that, um, so, you know, the question, so this is an interesting, the thing that I found interesting is that unions aren't deeply involved this time. And I really didn't talk about why I think they're not involved. Um, and I can speculate and be interested to hear if anybody has any additional thoughts on this. I think one of the reasons why they're not involved would be that the union movement of today is very different from the union movement of the 1970s and 80s in that we have a public sector dominated labor movement at the moment, and we didn't back then. That in essence, the, the attempt to try to get industrial policy was a last ditch effort by the industrial dominated union movement to try to defend itself and it failed. Um, and the question on, you know, so the other piece I have is, well, why is there, you know, I would argue that there is success now that, you know, when you're starting to get policies to, you know, promote the production of computer chips and other things like that, that is an industrial policy. And I think a lot of the reasons why you have success now is both parties see blue collar workers up for grabs. And I'll just stop there. All right, Eric, you're on next. Yeah, um, so as to the question of the relative benefits of um, kind of the more rank and file Facebook dynamic without the sort of politically driven focus aspect. You, you know, one way you can leverage some of that um, analytically is by comparing Oklahoma and um, Arizona to West Virginia. Because the West Virginia example, which um, I don't actually talk about in this paper as much, in some ways was more like that. It, it was definitely focused on an outcome, but it was not um, led in any sort of concerted way like the Oklahoma and Arizona ones. That there was, for, for instance, you could post anything. There was not really, it was very, very, another way of saying it's very lightly moderated. Um, whereas in Arizona and Oklahoma, every post actually was only by the administrators. So in Oklahoma, that's just one guy and in Arizona was seven. And then other people could comment. And so what you had in West Virginia was like a much more kind of volcanic and chaotic um, Facebook discussion. But that was only made possible in an effective way because there was also a really strong union. In some ways, part of the reason that the Facebook leadership didn't feel the need 
to sort of direct things was that they were unionists and they saw their role primarily as sort of pushing the union and facilitating discussion, but not in trying to substitute it in the way that to a certain extent they did in Oklahoma and Arizona. The limitation of that sort of tumultuous vibe was there was like a lot of rumors. Um, the, the main things that came up is there was a lot of rumors, sort of unchecked information. Somebody said, I heard this from XYZ person, the strike demands are this, or uh, the strike's about to end, or um, so there was a lot of rumors and it was hard to kind of get good information. And then the second main thing that came up um, talking with the leaders of it, and then just sort of I, I'm seeing it in person um, and on the group as it's going on, was that it was very hard for the most important points to get um, sort of diffused to the members of the Facebook group. Because when, every, when any, anybody can post anything, let's say some of the key organizers say, look, the, the, you know, the picket line is here tomorrow. But then if like two minutes after that, somebody just posts a picture of themselves on the picket line, right? Then the other thing gets lost very quickly. And the facilitators never figured out exactly how to um, balance that in West Virginia so that the key points would um, be centered uh, while continuing the sort of free for all dynamic. And I'm sure, I guess that's sort of an inherent tension. Okay, uh, Andrew and Zachary and Jack, you're on next. Andrew, do you wanna take the first shot? Yeah, sir, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in terms of kind of why satisfaction is important, um, I guess one of the things that comes to mind for me is that um, unions are democratic institutions um, in which, you know, there are elections for leadership positions. Um, and then kind of on the flip side of some of this stuff, we've also seen um, an expansion of right to work laws in some states and things like the Janus decisions. Um, and if if members are unsatisfied with uh, a direction that the union is going in, um, you know, whether the union's focusing on workplace activities or pro-social activities, um, I think that means that the, the union's ability to continue in that direction is probably not going to be able to happen. It'd be called into question. So for example, if unions want um, leadership to focus on workplace related issues, but um, the union decides to focus on societal issues, um, they're going to have kind of that disconnect and satisfaction. Um, and so that's kind of, then that would make it even harder, I think, for the union to continue in that direction moving forward. So that was one of the things that kind of came to mind for me about satisfaction. I'd also Do you have anything else you want to add, Dr. F yes. I'd add that uh, union satisfaction correlates with lots of other union related behaviors and attitudes such as union commitment, which has been linked to participation. And you could talk about engagement and involvement as probably just different forms of participation, union citizenship behaviors. Uh, a lot of these things are probably pretty tightly correlated. So if we're looking at union satisfaction, we're probably looking at something that is at least correlated with those other things, if not, in fact, a causal factor. All right, thanks. Um, so uh, Rachel and Johnny, your turn. You didn't get to answer question two. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, you asked whether it would what we did would apply to non-members. And I think in a very broad, loose sense, yes. Of course, we're not surveying non-members about their satisfaction with their union. But I would think that many of the same factors would influence their perceptions of whether the union was a good thing or a bad thing, even if we didn't call it union satisfaction. Andrew, do you want to add anything on that? Okay, we're done. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. No, I asked that because um, I've just come across a lot of uh, examples of labor activists who are not actually union members. Um, and so I often wonder, like, you know, these questions about what makes them tick and what motivates them. Anyway, um, so uh, uh, Rachel and Johnny, you're next. <laughs> Yeah, and thanks, Ian. That's a really interesting connection you made sort of between uh, Eric's paper and McAlevey's mobilizing organizing model in our paper. And I think I, I just have a couple of thoughts. 
Um, it's interesting because the one sort of, or the main sort of union tactics that we find to be significant in terms of first contract outcomes are these external pressure tactics. And if my understanding of McAlevey's model is correct, I think he'd probably refer to those more in sort of the mobilizing realm as opposed to the organizing, if that sort of clean cut distinction can be made. So I do just want to put that in context. We are still collecting data and NLRB organizing is obviously an important, but one slice of total organizing efforts. Obviously our, our paper doesn't look into the kind of strikes that Eric is talking about as an example. To make this point and something I've struggled with in my own uh, research otherwise uh, with regards to strikes and other sort of union organizing campaigns is how to adequately account for employer power. And I don't know if McAlevey does a great job of dealing with that distinction either. Eric, maybe you have a response to that. Uh, but it's something that I've struggled with and something that I think in this paper really trying to look for. Eric, uh, do you want to respond to that real quick? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to quantify it. I, I do think she's talked about it quite a bit. I think part of her argument uh, in relation to, for instance, the 2018 strikes compared to the Los Angeles strike is that one of the reasons why it's maybe less useful to try to generalize the um, relevance of the methods of the red state strikes as compared to um, Los Angeles um, is, is that the employer really was much stronger and better prepared in, in Los Angeles. There, there was an element of kind of like surprise, particularly in West Virginia, which is true. It, it, one really gets the impression that state employers there just really were not quite ready for what hit them. They didn't have their talking points. And even in the last couple of years, you've seen like clearly they've gotten coached by Alec and, and, and they've, they've lined up their ducks in West Virginia in a much more systematic way. Uh, whereas in Los Angeles, again, this was, you know, like um, a superintendent who was tied to billionaires, he himself was a billionaire. Um, and um, in that context, just sort of the volcanic type Facebook dynamic wouldn't have been sufficient, was her argument explicitly, to have um, won what they won. That's hard to quantify, but I, it, it does seem pretty clearly be the case as you compare those strikes at least. All right, so Bradley Weinberg has had his hand up for a while. Bradley, why don't you ask your question? Uh, so my, my, I got my question for uh, Johnny and Rachel, and um, I don't know if you, uh, I mean, obviously it's hard to, to get a lot of the analysis out of eight minute presentations, but I'm wondering if in the analysis you've done so far, are you finding that the tactics um, across, again, you're, you're making the argument they're connected, but, you know, if we're distinct to think of the, the election phase and then the, the first contract negotiation, are they reinforcing, and again, this might vary depending on the tactic or if it's an employer tactic versus a union tactic, but are you finding, are they reinforcing, or are there certain tactics that actually maybe help at the, the election phase, but then backfire during the negotiation phase? So if, you know, if the union goes all out, you know, corporate campaign shames the employer, right? That might help them get the election, but then, you know, reduce the likelihood of a, of a first contract. Are you, are you finding, so are you finding, um, like I said, reinforcing or contradictory um, effects of, of certain tactics? Um, and, and likewise, you know, there's, there's some, some uh, research out there about backfiring effects of employer tactics. Are you also finding, right, are, are, are you finding employer tactics are, you know, almost uniformly having a negative effect or are you finding some kind of backfiring effects or, and I don't know how you would maybe tease that out, but if, if you could do, you know, kind of interaction effects of, you know, the, you know, I think Katie Brown and Brenner did some of that, the more, you know, the more tactics, you know, do you reach a certain level, perhaps something to think about to where um, there's either diminishing effects of those tactics or even, you know, a reversal of the effect of those tactics. You guys want to answer that as well as this question from James about decertification votes? So, so I think uh, Rachel answered the question in the chat from James. I'm not sure if he has a follow-up, but Rachel, I'm going to turn it over to you if that's okay to answer. Yeah. Um, so that's a good question and certainly something that we've looked at. Um, 
there is an interaction effect per se. So it's, you know, when you're interacting similar, you know, employer tactics pre-election and post-election, you're not actually getting more of an effect. So um, the interactions are actually all not statistically significant, but it is the case that certain tactics do have either a different effect or don't affect one phase and do affect another. So for example, um, when we talked about the um, increasing external pressure tactics, um, it actually, in the organizing phase, so those sort of pressure tactics from the union don't have a statistically significant effect on the outcome of the organizing campaign, but then do actually have an effect in terms of the negotiation phase. So um, again, this is very preliminary because unfortunately we are missing like 3042 observations of 242. Um, so I don't want to say anything too much, but um, it is very possible, for example, for that, that you know, those pressure tactics are those that have been characterized as bringing the community in and really getting people knowing what's going on in the campaign. And it's possible that that then actually puts pressure on the employer to actually reach an agreement in the negotiation phase. Um, when it comes to employer tactics, what we found um, is that like oddly enough, for example, the, um, you know, the employer having a captive audience meeting during the um, bargaining or during the organizing phase obviously has a negative effect both on the outcome of the organizing campaign and also on the outcome of getting a, a first contract. Um, but there are employers that actually also have captive audience meetings during bargaining. Uh, those don't have an effect. Um, it's about 20, I think it was between 20 and 25% of employers who are doing that. So it's not really the fact that there's just not enough of them in the data to be able to see an effect. But um, so they do have, you know, there are some employer tactics that you think might have an effect and they don't. Um, do, do you have any sense why they're having captive audience meetings during bargaining? Is that to influence a ratification vote or to push towards decertification to- um, Yeah, so that's, that's a good question. I, I'm not know. entirely sure. To make it clear, for example, that, I mean, I know one of the things that they're often talking about during organizing campaigns in these in these captive audience meetings is just because you've unionized doesn't mean you're gonna actually see any changes. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a message that's being reinforced. Um, unfortunately, the survey was designed so it provides us more quantitative data than it does really rich descriptive qualitative data. Um, mm -hmm. But that is something because we are gonna do follow-ups with um, some of the unions for some of the key item non-response, um, it is something that we could explore further, but it's not something right now that the data and the survey speak to. Sure. Okay, well, we have two minutes to go. Uh, are, is there a final question from the audience or comment from the panelists? I can ask one more quick question of the of, of Johnny and Rachel again. I just wondered was because uh, I didn't the slide went by so quick. So I think it said seventy percent success rate on the election, and then it was sixty nine percent on the contract. Is that sixty nine percent of the seventy percent or of the? Okay. It's it's 69% of the 70, but it also okay. is the case that what that's looking at is actually a two year window out, like from certification yeah. more or less. So one yeah. of the, actually one of the things we really want to follow up with the unions about is um, we had asked in the survey for the ratification date of the contract. Um, so that, and, and some of them were missing. So we need to get that because then we could actually impose a one year date as the dependent variable and just see how these things actually, um, like what is the proportion of them that actually received it within a year. Um, but unfortunately, because of COVID and getting our survey out, we didn't, we weren't able to do it within the window of just a year. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so it's now 2.30. I want to thank uh, the speakers for their um, really nice presentations and papers and thank the audience for um, some good questions. Um, thank you, Ian. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. See you. All right. All right. Have a good one. Thank you. Good night.